In this news roundup of the week for the 20th of May 2022, the growing global food crisis starts to see unrest spreading in the countries that are being worst hit. Russia finally crushes resistance at Mariupol, but is mostly focused on the blame game for its failures. In the US, the left has jumped onto a terrible shooting as a tool to associate their opponents with actual neo-Nazism. Australia is imminently to head to the polls in an election that has been avoiding the topic voters say they most care about. And in this week's Short Thought, I talk about avoiding the victim role people may be trying to put you into, thinking that they're doing you a favour. My name's Malin Baker, this is The Malin Baker Show. The impact of the Ukraine war plus extreme weather events are set up to create a wave of consequences across the world in the coming months in terms of feeding people. According to reports, Russian forces in Ukraine have been targeting and destroying some of the infrastructure needed for grain production, as well as blocking the ports that are the usual route for such product to be shipped out. Specifically, they have destroyed silos and farm equipment in Kherson, Luhansk and Donetsk. Largely, the objective seems to be simply to deny Ukraine the revenue that would come from the market. Not seen any suggestion that Russia aims to cause harm specifically to the countries that have been most reliant on Ukrainian wheat and vegetable oil. In terms of access to grain, these include Lebanon, which gets 80% of its wheat from Ukraine and has been enduring problems of its own already for several years, as we know. Moldova, Qatar and Pakistan are also heavily exposed. But of course, the impact doesn't just get felt by the countries that are the direct markets for that wheat. Bank of England Governor Andrew Bailey this week warned of what he described as an apocalyptic global food shortage fueling further food price increases. Fuel, fertiliser and animal feed prices have all skyrocketed, spreading the pain to all countries, but particularly those where the costs of food remain a higher proportion of household income, which is up to 60% in the poorest countries. And the safest prediction you can make about all of this is that it's going to result in a wave of unrest in numerous parts of the world as the consequences really start to bite. So in Sri Lanka, a member of parliament from the governing party was beaten to death by a mob amidst protests over a food and medicine shortage. Agricultural production in Sri Lanka was devastated when the government last year announced a ban on the import of chemical fertilisers and agrochemicals, just as the rice planting season got underway. The reason given was because of the health impact of the overuse of chemicals in agriculture, although analysts suggested the real reason might have been due to the lack of foreign exchange to pay for the imports. In any case, the results have been predictable. Now, what's happening in Sri Lanka can be taken as something of a foretaste of what we might expect to see in a number of countries in the coming months because of Ukraine. Iran has already seen food riots leading to at least one death following the government's announcement that the cost of cooking oil, chicken, eggs and milk would increase by up to 300%. Peru and Argentina have also seen protests in the last couple of months. David Beasley, the head of the United Nations World Food Programme, predicted that in a number of Middle Eastern and African countries particularly, you would see unrest that would be exploited by political extremists, leading to riots, famine and political destabilisation. He argued that both the Arab Spring uprising in 2011 and the war in Syria followed food price inflation and supply chain issues and said that some of the key measures are already worse than those incidents. Pre-pandemic, it was estimated that around 80 million people were on the edge of starvation. Now 276 million are thought to be at that level. There are two other factors also adding to the pressure. One is the inevitable incidence in some parts of the world in any single year of unfavourable weather conditions. That has come this year in the form of unusually hot temperatures in India at an earlier stage of the year back in March when the cooler weather of spring normally supports the harvesting of the wheat. As a result, there has been a significant reduction in the wheat harvest and the Indian government announced this week an export ban, although existing agreements will be honoured. This will squeeze Indian farmers, who will be forced to sell their grain for lower prices to the government rather than for the higher prices available right now on the world market. 
And none of this is helped by the fact that winter wheat in the western United States is seeing reduced yields due to drought conditions. But there's also another factor, which is down to financial speculators making money from the volatile situation. For example, in a nine-day period in March, the price of wheat on futures markets climbed by 54%, even though there was nothing to justify the climb from wheat stock-to-use ratios. Global wheat stocks are actually currently high relative to historical trends. That's the sort of thing that reflects the action of commodity investors gambling on rising food prices. There is no prospect of an early change in the situation with food supplies from Ukraine. This week, Russia finally ground down its opponents in Mariupol to force their surrender. You weren't supposed to call it a surrender, but it's simply a description of fact. It was hardly an ignoble surrender, given the length of time the fighters had held out, cut off from the other Ukrainian forces as they had been for over a month. It was originally intended that Mariupol would be taken quickly, Then it was put back to Victory Day on May the 9th, and that didn't happen either. But the outcome was inevitable at some point. The strategic goal was the control of Mariupol, and therefore to prevent Ukraine's access to the Sea of Azov, shutting down its ability to sell and ship its products, as we've just been discussing. And for now, that seems to be in place. Not much else. Although the counter moves from the West are not all going smoothly either. Last week we were talking about how Finland and Sweden were about to jump into NATO's open embrace to the annoyance of Putin. And indeed, on Wednesday this week, the two countries formally handed their membership requests to the NATO Secretary General, Jens Stoltenberg. Such things rarely happen without someone seeking to use the situation for their own advantage, and in this case it turns out to be Turkish President Erdogan, who objected to the move, which is one of those things that is almost inevitable in systems that require unanimity to make a decision. Turkey seems to be aiming to use the situation to push Finland and Sweden to respond to its historic demands that they prevent support from being given to the Kurdistan Workers' Party, the PKK, which Ankara holds to be a terrorist organisation. Erdogan said that he had been asking Sweden for 30 people he labelled as terrorists, but to no avail. He said this, giving all kinds of support to the PKK YPG terrorist organisation and also asking us for support for NATO membership, is, to say the least, inconsistent. Now, as the official reason, it's likely also that Erdogan will be seeking movement in the negotiations he currently has ongoing with the United States over the purchase of fighter jets. Allies are now seeking a solution to the obstacles, which of course is the point. If you look around the world and wonder at how often you see squeaky wheels, it's because they get more grease. It would be surprising if those obstacles were not overcome in relatively short order, however, which will hopefully be some consolation for Finland in the light of the breaking but not unexpected news that Russia will be cutting off its supply of Russian gas tomorrow. Russia's irritation with Finland and Sweden will remain amongst its stack of complaints, but by no means near the top given how the war has been going. According to British intelligence, Russia has sacked senior commanders for their poor performance in the invasion of Ukraine, a reflection of what was described as a toxic environment of cover-ups and scapegoating. That would not be a surprise, since such outcomes are historically the norm in authoritarian countries when things start to go wrong. Lieutenant General Serhii Kissel commander of the elite First Guards tank army, had been suspended for failing to take Kharkiv. Vice Admiral Igor Osipov, who commanded the Black Sea Fleet, was likely suspended after the sinking of the Moskva cruiser last month. That one hasn't been finally confirmed. How much responsibility these generals really had is an open question, given the consistent reports that Putin himself, plus the Chief of General Staff General Valery Gerasimov, appear to be micromanaging the invasion, interfering in tactical details well below what they should be touching. And that sort of thing feeds the downward spiral in the battlefield, as many other officials will be increasingly focused on not being blamed for setbacks, so they defer key decisions up the line more and more. 
and remote decision making is more inclined to be callous towards the individual soldiers on the ground. So Dara Massicott, senior policy researcher, wrote for Foreign Affairs magazine that troops were being treated as an afterthought, that the Russians could simply throw people at poorly designed objectives until it succeeds which unsurprisingly produces low morale and an unwillingness to fight. Maybe some of that can be seen in the tired resignation of the first Russian soldier to be tried for a war crime. Sergeant Vadim Shishimarin admitted shooting an elderly civilian in the head through an open car window four days into the invasion, something he said that he was ordered to do. Following forensic investigations, which are still ongoing, the Ukrainian Prosecutor General said that cases were being prepared against 41 soldiers for offences including bombing civilian targets, killing and raping civilians, as well as looting. She reported that they're looking into more than 10,700 potential war crimes involving more than 600 suspects, including Russian soldiers and government officials. One should expect that Russia will begin to reciprocate against some of its own captives, which it will accuse similarly of war crimes, albeit probably with rather less robust evidence. In principle, the forces that were captured at Mariupol are intended to be traded in prisoner swaps. However, since a number of the fighters are from the Azov Regiment, the very people that Putin has held up as the Nazis that justify his invasion... A number of Russian politicians are arguing that such people should be executed, not allowed to go free. And quite probably after a show designed to counter the war crimes trials being carried out on the other side. No single one war crime in Ukraine, however, will have the same impact as one terrible crime is having in the US. America, unfortunately, this week became the focus again for another mass shooting. This one a racially motivated attack by a genuine white supremacist against mostly black victims. It was first and foremost a tragedy for the victims and their families, as all such terrible events are. And there's two things the political and media class of America could do. In that situation, the first is that politicians left and right could form a united front saying we condemn this action, we condemn the ideology that led to this action, whatever our other differences, we stand united on this as one country. But obviously that didn't happen. Everyone condemned the action, for sure, as you would hope and expect, but then the toxic blame game began, because the two sides have defined race as one of the key election issues that defines their identity. On the one hand, Republicans have pointed at critical race theory in schools, saying that teaching white children that they're morally to blame and inherently racist and America's founded on slavery, that those things are wrong. And they pointed at immigration and highlighted statements by Democrats that the shifting demographics it produces are likely to favour Democrats, suggesting that's why they are so pro-illegal immigration. On the other side, Democrats say, no, no, what's being taught in schools is just that racism is bad and there's been some bad examples of it in history. It's not critical race theory at all. And they then point at those Republican arguments on immigration and they say, but this, this is the great replacement theory as espoused by, for instance, the Buffalo Shooter. The Great Replacement is a genuinely extreme belief that the white race is being intentionally wiped out by a cabal of sinister types led by the Jews, according to the 180-page manifesto that the shooter produced. It is genuinely disgusting white supremacist nonsense. Everyone I've seen commenting on it agrees on that much. But the left won't accept that agreement. They go on to say that it is indistinguishable from what commentators such as Tucker Carlson and Ben Shapiro have been espousing. Now, looking at this from the outside, that is plainly not the case. The shooter's ideology on Great Replacement is about racial purity, nothing to do with the idea that changing demographics have an effect on voting intentions. That is a mainstream belief that Democrats have often talked about themselves. Joe Biden, you will recall, once quipped that if you didn't vote for him, then you weren't really black. It's not as though such things haven't been openly discussed. 
It doesn't matter, but V. Shooter did not mention or praise Fox News. He slammed conservatism and disparaged mainstream figures at the heart of it. And I say it doesn't matter because sometimes crazy bad people will cite people they admire. It doesn't make their actions the fault of those people. A Bernie Sanders supporter shot up a congressional baseball match. That was not Bernie Sanders' fault. And what the Buffalo shooter did was not Tucker Carlson's fault or Ben Shapiro's fault or any of the rest of them. But the attempt to argue that it is, that is the really toxic way to deal with this sort of tragic incident. Indeed, you could look at all the news articles suggesting that there is now this big overlap between mainstream politicians and a genuine neo-Nazi philosophy, and I guess you could call that disinformation. Just too late for the attention of Joe Biden's new disinformation board, because having been attacked on numerous fronts, the board was announced as having been paused this week, and its director of three weeks, Nina Jakauchi, has resigned. Possibly the rapid collapse came because criticisms were not solely coming from the right in this case. Civil liberties and human rights groups such as Protect Democracy and the Electronic Frontier Foundation had criticised its fuzzily defined mission, which sat uneasily, they said, with the DHS's poor track record on privacy and free speech rights. A government spokesperson complained about how things are gone, the board's purpose has been grossly and intentionally mischaracterised. It was never about censorship or policing speech in any manner. Well, OK, but these are the same people who are now trying to pin the Buffalo shooting on Tucker Carlson, who might well feel that his speech is being policed rather actively, as various mainstream figures call for him to be deplatformed. So it's not entirely unreasonable that people in these polarised times are somewhat concerned about how such initiatives are going to play out. Nevertheless, the false start was blamed on the right-wing backlash. I'm curious as to why the government would have cared about the so-called right-wing backlash. I mean, seriously, if Joe Biden's only going to do things now that Tucker Carlson would accept, uh, how does that work? Of course, that's probably not the reason at all. More likely, it was the friendly fire and the recognition that, yeah, they'd kind of badly bungled the launch. Now, obviously, you're not going to admit that, at least not when you're in campaigning mode, as they're going to be until November. Speaking of campaigning mode, they're not the only ones. Australia goes to the polls this weekend. I've been looking for hooks to do an item on the Australian campaign for weeks, but it all seems to have been pretty routine stuff. Various outside writers have done articles about how central the issue of climate change is to this election. I haven't seen much evidence of that reflected in how the coverage in Australia has been playing out, bar one item, which we'll talk about. But it does seem to get some reflection in the polls, with vote compass data showing climate to be the top issue that people are concerned about, along with the economy and cost of living. The lack of heat on the topic might well be a reflection on the state of the respective parties' policies. Whereas in the past you had highly contrasting positions between the parties, in this election, somewhat less so. Scott Morrison's government has half-heartedly signed up to a net zero by 2050 policy, a goal that is rather hard to achieve in a half-hearted way, and it has been short on details on how exactly it's going to get there. There's a range of technologies that it hopes will continue to develop to the point where emissions reductions happen, such as carbon capture and storage, hydrogen and solar. There is no additional spend associated with the plan for this election manifesto beyond what has already been committed, which you might argue is a mismatch between the stated objective and delivery, which you can take as being optimism or cynicism. Take your pick. The Labour Party, led by Anthony Albanese, has the same net zero goal, with a little more enthusiasm. They have a 43% cut target by 2030, which is in line with that recommended by the Business Council of Australia. You might take it as an aim to be less tone deaf to the concerns of coal mining communities, which was seen to be a factor in the 2019 election, when against expectations they went down to defeat. And that matters, 
because going into polling day tomorrow, the expectations are once again for a Labour victory, albeit probably leading a minority government. That hasn't stopped others seeking to make the climate a bigger issue in the campaign. So there are a number of so-called teal independent candidates standing, sort of bluey green campaigners trying to push a higher priority on environmental action onto the Conservative platform. And it's speculation they may end up with leverage in a close result. The campaigning group Climate Council made some headlines several weeks ago with a report claiming that significant parts of Australia would soon become uninsurable because of climate change. Uninsurable Nation, it was titled, and it stated this, Insurance will become increasingly unaffordable or unavailable in large parts of Australia due to worsening extreme weather. If you looked at the methodology, which took some digging, I can attest, you found that the report they produced used the IPCC's RCP 8.5 Most Extreme Pessimistic Scenario for its figures, which was obviously part of a campaign imperative to come up with the most dramatic figures possible. That said, the defenders pointed out that the target date discussed in the report was 2030. And on that rather short timeline, there's actually not that much difference between any of the scenarios. The real divergences kick in later. Which is true, but nevertheless it still highlighted that this was basically a campaign document. Not a scientific study, not a firm prediction relating to the insurance market that you should set store by. And indeed it's got its figures by taking the most pessimistic flood risk figures in areas liable to flooding and the most pessimistic drought risk in areas prone to drought pulled them all together into one super worst case accumulation of the worst of the worst. Now you could legitimately do that if you were a company looking at insurance worst case risk scenarios, say for the purposes of pricing your insurance products. How you factor in low likelihood, high cost events, always going to be part of that mix. But to suggest that was going to happen with high probability, that it was going to result in your property becoming uninsurable and that within eight years, well, it's a sign of the lack of critical scrutiny that a lot of the mainstream media bring to these issues, that it attracted so many headlines as it did. Some would say that just makes it an effective campaign group. It's a group that understands how to make potential consequences concrete and real for its target audience. And you can say that while also recognising that you shouldn't get your insurance advice, your scientific advice, nor probably your voting advice from such partisan campaigners. Which is not to say there won't be substantial impacts on the lives of many Australians in the future from climate change on the reasonable likely scenarios in front of us. If you've got merit on your side, you shouldn't need to exaggerate or cherry pick to support your cause. I keep saying it, people on both sides don't listen. Probably because fear mongering is indeed effective campaigning, as those headlines attest. Anyway, we look forward with interest and support for the citizens of Australia as they exercise their democratic rights this weekend. In the UK, we saw an interesting story unfold over the last couple of weeks that I thought said a lot about the traps that we dig for ourselves. A Conservative MP, Lee Anderson, made what were considered to be highly outrageous and insensitive remarks about food banks, the operation set up to distribute food to some of the poorest people in the community. What did he say? He said that there is not a massive need for food banks in the UK and he added that people who knew how to cook and how to budget could make meals for as little as 30 pence a day. Well, you know what comes next. Cue the outrage, the poverty campaigners saying this privileged out-of-touch Tory knows nothing about the topic. He was labelled an idiot, inhumane, crass and cruel, morally bankrupt. It was all about victim blaming, they said. But then it turned out that actually it kind of wasn't. So Lee Anderson was brought up in a deprived community in his constituency. He'd been a miner for 10 years, volunteered for Citizen Advice Bureau for another 10, worked in hostels for the homeless, was originally a Labour MP until he switched a couple of years ago, and is involved in his local food bank. 
That food bank encourages long-term users to join the 15-week cookery course that it runs. And this is what he referred to. He enthusiastically told the House of Commons this, Come to Ashfield and work with me for a day in my food bank and see the brilliant scheme we have in place. We show them how to cook cheap and nutritious meals on a budget. We can make a meal for about 30 pence a day and this is cooking from scratch. I think you will see firsthand that there's not this massive use for food banks in this country. But generation after generation who cannot cook properly, they can't cook a meal from scratch, they cannot budget. Note, he did not say there was no need for food banks, just that it wasn't massive in the way that it was portrayed by the press. Not how the Guardian represented what he'd said, of course, suggesting that actually he said that lack of cooking skills was, quote, the main cause of food poverty, which is not remotely what he said. And it turned out that what he said was supported by endorsements by people that had been on those courses. In other words, what he'd said was true. And while people in the worst situations do still need some support, it highlighted the big divide, as always, on these things. Do you train people to be more resilient and skilled in the face of challenges? Or do you take it on yourself, yourself in this case being the government and the charity sector, to take those people under your wing because they have become enfeebled while castigating anyone suggesting that there might be some role for encouraging them to be less feeble. The most remarkable thing is how even to explore that possibility produces this almighty instinctive backlash. Not that he's necessarily right in everything he said, just that it's held to be unsayable, undiscussable. So easy to straw man those statements. So you're saying it's for poor's own fault, etc, etc. And this is the state of our political discourse. We can notice it while trying to focus on what approaches are supported by the facts and the evidence. But let's at least start by taking responsibility for ourselves and how we respond to this. I mean, if you were one of those people visiting the food bank, that may be far away from where you are today, but... Never believe you can't experience times of difficulty of some sort. We all get setbacks. Now, are you one of those who will get offended when encouraged to improve yourself? Or are you one of those who will happily believe that you have the power to improve your own situation? The point is that the things that are out of your control are just that, out of your control. Key survival skill then is to focus on the things that you can control. And that's a basic truth, regardless of the nature of the difficulty that you're having to deal with. Preventing people from even having that discussion for fear of being accused of victim blaming is not helping anyone. And nobody is helping you by telling you that you're a victim and other people should be looked to as the only possible answer. All right. My thanks, as always, to the good people who support this channel on Patreon. As you know, I simply could not put the time in to creating these videos without that support. It is an elite group. And if you would like to join it, you can do that by heading on over to patreon.com forward slash Malin Baker. It is always appreciated. Either way, have a great week. My name is Malin Baker. This is The Malin Baker Show. Thanks for watching this video. If you liked it, please share with anyone else you think would also enjoy it. Word of mouth is really important to us. And if you've not subscribed yet, what are you waiting for? As the saying goes, that subscribe button won't smash itself. So.